Hey, everyone, I'm Mac. Uh, my talk is Bring Console to Production. So yeah, uh, who am I? Obviously, uh, redundant. Um, yeah, so <laughs> uh, I'm a software engineer here at DO, uh, and I work on a team called Delivery Engineering. Uh, it's a relatively new team at DigitalOcean, but uh, we kind of like to sell ourselves as DigitalOcean for DigitalOcean. And so that's the idea of simplifying what it takes to be an uh, engineer at DO and like getting your software into production, the steps there within the process, et cetera. Uh, and so our kind of our goal is that our the way we're going to meet our goal is by providing primitives for our engineers to use. And so some of those primitives might be like service discovery, which is going to be the focus of this talk, uh, build and CI, deployment orchestration, and other similar uh, type things. Pretty much anything HashiCorp has as a as a as a product, we'll probably do. Uh, and so here's some examples of what we deploy at DO uh, to give you an idea of, of kind of our stack and how it works. Uh, so the top two, control panel and API, uh, pretty straightforward, uh, exactly what they sound like. Uh, they're deployed on droplets, and they're a Rails, both Rails applications. Uh, billing is also a Rails, a Ruby application, but it's not Rails, it's Sinatra. And it's also not a web application. It's an internal service where we expose an API, but we also do a lot of background work, processing invoices, uh, et cetera. Metadata would be the metadata service you might interact with if you ever spin up a drop on DO. And that runs on every hypervisor in our cloud, which is quite a few, uh, written in Go. And so it's a very stateful application. And that's kind of the distinction between the top three and the, and the rest is the top three are very stateless. Uh, from w they don't really care where they run. They just need to run. And a lot of their state's held in a central like, database uh, or other kind of data store. And then like metadata, event processing, also runs on hypervisors, Golang, Perl. I'm sure a lot of you already saw the Perl. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> but uh, it is, again, another very stateful application. Uh, its artifact being the droplet it creates, the lifecycle it manages, et cetera. Um, so then the bottom two, image storage and image transfer, are two relatively new services at DO. Um, these are internal platforms for managing droplet images. And so they both run on, on physical hardware, uh, but not the hypervisors. Different physical hardware uh, contained in each region. And again, written in Go. Um, so very stateful very opinionated on where they're going to run and how, like, what the hardware will look like. And so uh, this kind of leads to the problem of service discovery. Uh, so service discovery kind of loosely defined of, of where are you and how can I talk to you. Uh, and so the pattern you'll see is as nodes increase, nodes being either services or uh, instances of those services increases, the interconnectedness of those nodes will increase dramatically. Uh, it's not really a linear, linear uh, increase, more exponential. And so it makes sense, right? A node can talk to many services, and the services might have many nodes. And so it just becomes a very large mess of uh, interconnected pieces. So right now, the first version of service discovery at DO is, is Chef. And, and uh, we use a lot of Chef at DO. And so it gets overloaded in a lot of cases. Uh, Chef is actually pretty good. It's reliable, but it's really slow. Uh, it's reliable because we have one source of truth that gives a very consistent snapshot of the world at any given time. Uh, but it'll, because of the scale at which we run our Chef uh, setup, we can only do one converge per node per hour. Uh, and so that means your data could be stale for up to an hour, depending on how, you know, when it changed and when you last did your Chef converge. Um, and then it also kind of leads to some circular dependencies where you might need a successful Chef run in order to be able to do a successful Chef run. Uh, <laughs> And so that's not great, because that's never going to work. Um, and so what ends up happening is you have to bootstrap the node into a different role, and then essentially reassign it into the role that it will be in its final life cycle, which is not a fun thing as a developer or an operations person to have to do. It's a lot of waste of time, something computers might be really good at. So point of this talk, let's move to console. Um, reasons we like console. Very feature rich, it has a lot of built in nice things to have, dynamic registration because of an API, health checks, event streams, uh, many APIs for interacting with it. Again, the HP API is powerful and extensible. You can easily build things on top of it, which is a big plus for us. We don't have to worry about implementing that, it's already there available to us. And then a straightforward DNS interface, meaning kind of integrating with the legacy services will be a lot easier because we don't have to change how they look at the world. We just have to maybe change the, the name that they try to look up or change where they try to look that name up. Uh, and so that makes it a lot easier for us where we have a lot of legacy systems that we may not 
uh, want to work on too heavily, but we still want them to benefit from the new nice tabs. So how do we do it? Um, and so this is kind of our a snapshot into our organization. Uh, in order to introduce a new service like console, we use an RFC. Uh, they're very successful in open source world and all over the internet, and so we, we kind of stole that pattern and, and use it internally. Um, and so an RFC might look like something like this, kind of the purpose of the RFC. What do we want to do? And so we're driving consensus towards this, this new software that we want to introduce. Um, and then as a means to doing that, we want to explain the strengths and weaknesses of that service. Nothing's perfect, everything has trade-offs when, you, when you're writing software. And so some strengths and weaknesses of console were brought up and kind of weighed against each other. Also against the competitors in similar spaces. And as part of this RFC, we also kind of outlined our rollout plan. Uh, what are the steps we will take in order to get to that final end goal of console and production? Um, and so ours looked like this. We'd start with kind of regional clusters. As I said, we have, or as you might know, we have uh, 11 data centers now. And so we, we segment our data very, very much based on those data centers. And so that's something that was a big strength for console is it already has that support kind of built in. We're gonna grow those clusters very slowly. And so that's meant to kind of limit our failure domain. If there will be a problem, only a subset of the nodes will be impacted, and then we can easily roll that back as opposed to kind of snapshot 100% in and kind of like fingers crossed, hope it works. Um, so yeah, rollback and fallback plans. Part of any rollout process should also be how will I go backwards if something goes wrong. Uh, and so it's very important to have those in place and tested beforehand, otherwise you're going to increase your time to recovery uh, significantly. So then another bit would be gathering metrics and gaining operational experience. So as the cluster grows, what happens? Like what, what, what load gets increased? What failures do we see? Do we see any failures? Um, another big part of this is it's not just good enough to gather metrics, it's also very important that you know where to look for those metrics. Um, kind of the old idea of if a tree falls in the woods, does it make noise? Uh, if a metric is, is gathered, does anyone care? Like, doesn't really matter. So, and then on our fifth point was integrating small services. So obviously console service discovery, you need to have services, and so we picked a subset of them to integrate with early and, and see how they did. And the whole point of RFCs is peer review. And that's something we believe heavily in, as you might imagine. Uh, even the slide deck was peer reviewed, and that was the outcome. This slide was actually unnecessary. And those are the points that I talked to. <laughs> All right, great. So we have our RFC. Uh, we've gotten thumbs up, everyone's bought in. Well, let's do it. Let's see what happens. And so this is kind of what happened. Um, very, it was over the course of a few days, if you can't see at the bottom. Um, we slowly grew our cluster, added a subset of it, our infrastructure, no problems. We added 1% of our hypervisors, and the, bug, the code that was introducing those is actually buggy. Instead of adding 1% of hypervisors consistently, it would add randomly 1% of hypervisors per hour. Um, <laughs> pretty cool. Which actually would have been a really good approach to doing this problem, because we do want to grow the cluster slowly, but it wasn't the, actual, wasn't the plan originally. Uh, and so notice the bug about a day later after it had grown a little bit, no real problems. Uh, and so then we ended up bumping up to 10% of total nodes. And then 25% is the next uh, kind of peak. And then 50% is the top. And so as you can see, pretty consistent, no problem. One region jumps up to 50%, and then at some point in the day we immediately brought it back down. Uh, and so that's why this talk is not just about console, it's also about uh, computers. And so yeah, that's one of our largest regions. It was significantly larger than the second largest region, and we had a problem. So, this is some metrics gathered during, during that giant peak, and then the, cons the subsequent uh, nosedive. Uh, and so this top one is, is one of our, our routers, our management uh, routers here at DigitalOcean. Again, this, we kind of rolled this out, and because we limited our failure domain, uh, the only issue we saw was actually management, uh, no customer impacting uh, traffic or any, any status was needed. Uh, so yeah, management router, obviously not great, 100% CPU load, dropping some metrics gathering is always a really bad sign, uh, and then it, it drops off. Same down here is uh, we have Kibana for internal centralized logging, and so this is console errors that it was spitting out during this, during this problem. That's, that's about 30 million hits in about three hours, so we did, we did a pretty good job of, of making things break. 
Oh uh, yeah, so don't panic, roll back. The whole point of having a rollback plan is to be able to use it. And so we, we did that. We paused our rollout, stopped adding more nodes. Uh, we drastically, drastically brought the cluster size down, uh, which is the gateway kind of became healthy again. And we did, uh, we wrote a postmortem and conducted some root cause analysis. So what did we find? Yeah, computers are, are hard, especially when you're dealing with thousands of, of nodes in a layer two network, which I had never dealt with before, and not many people do on a daily basis. And that's one of the problems we face here at DO. And so what happens is, console's gossip actually worked exactly how it was supposed to work. Uh, it did everything it was, it was said it would do, and that was a problem for us at the time. Uh, so the, the root cause was the ARP cache on all the machines was actually getting filled. Uh, it was getting filled to the point that it was hitting GC thresh three, which is the maximum number of ARP, ARP entries you're allowed to have in the ARP cache. Uh, and when that happens, it no longer inserts entries in the ARP cache, and you get a syslog error, and all things blow up, and any UDP or TCP connections complain because they can't connect to the thing they expect to be able to connect to, and which was the cause for the huge spike. So yeah, uh, and so this was caused because every second, it tries to talk to about 15 nodes, uh, depending on how member list is configured. And, and so each one of those requests actually resulted in a broadcast ARP request because it was a cache miss, and the broadcast ARP request then gets forwarded along to our router that we saw in the, in the previous graph. And when it hit the router, the router has to decide, do I need to respond to this broadcast ARP or, or is it okay? Whereas every other node in the infrastructure can say, it's not me, I don't care, and it drops it immediately. Um, so that's the cost for the increased load is as broadcast ARPs went up, load went up, and then it couldn't handle it anymore, and then traffic started to deteriorate significantly to the point that it was causing a less than healthy network, which caused nodes to be marked as unhealthy, which then actually resulted in more gossip traffic as things started to refute and say that others were dead, and then more and more problems. So it's kind of a vicious cycle of, of really like just gathering on top of itself. And so great, uh, we can probably fix this. It's, it's a known thing. And this, so this is, a, this, is a, this is a rare picture of our router at the time. Uh, it's having a little fun. Okay, so great, we can, we can definitely tune that. Uh, the ARP cache has, exposes all kinds of uh, different knobs that you can, you can fiddle with. Obvi you don't normally have to do it if you're running a non-layer two network like ours, or like most standard networks, uh, but we did. So we tuned it, great. So this is actually uh, when we were at HashiConf, which is amazing. Uh, the the Wi-Fi was good enough that we're like, all right, well, let's do it again. So we tuned our ARP cache, uh, everything rolled out, introduced more nodes, uh, but this time we also noticed the increased load. We didn't actually have an, any kind of a weird management event, but we saw the load was not doing what we expected it to do and said it was increasing. And so we said, okay, well, let's, let's, let's back off again and kind of revisit. Yeah, uh, so great. Sometimes even your you know, best laid plans. Uh, so yeah, there was actually a kernel bug. In kernel 3.9 or, or anything below 3.9 didn't respect GC thresh one, which is the kernel setting for this is the uh, this is the allowed size of my ARP cache before you GC. So it'd be, it, currently it's 128, it's the default. So it's, you can have up to 128 and then it won't GC. However, uh, you can tune that. And so we tuned it up significantly higher because there was very little uh, minus for us. And most of the places it actually worked really well. Um, yeah, so the big region didn't, didn't actually uh, benefit from it. And so it continued to GC, uh, churn through the ARP cache and, and spam broadcast ARPs. And so, but this is actually what uh, the second biggest region looks like, which did benefit from the tuning. Uh, you can see we were something at like a, a little bit above 50% CPU load, and it just nosedived as soon as we introduced the tuning back down to the like 20% where we hover at uh, everywhere regardless of the size of the region. Yeah, so overall, not a big deal. Th that region's actually slated, to, we're just gonna forget about it. Uh, it's just dead to me. Uh, no, it's actually going, undergoing, currently undergoing improvements to become our, the newest version of our cloud, and so it'll actually already become uh, a kernel that, that isn't super old. Great, so kind of the point of this talk. Uh, one thing that has been really frustrating is you keep, when you keep running into walls. Uh, we were really excited about all the, the, the nice things to have, uh, or all the things console would give us, but there's a lot of arduous pain to go through before we get there. And yeah, I mean, some, some things I was able to gain because we ended up hitting a lot of bugs that we didn't actually expect to hit 
was that I've learned more about TCP dump than I ever expected to learn, which is an amazing tool when you need it. Before then, you're just like, what does this thing do? Just, it's just like the ultimate hacker output of like just data. Um, yeah, so we actually ended up finding some bad actors in our infrastructure that were already undergoing this, this GC, the, the uh, ARP table GC uh, loop, which is kind of cool. Uh, we were able to just cursory benefit. Learn more about ARPs than I have ever expected to learn in my entire life. It was like, when it's just one of the things you've never really expected because it just works up until it doesn't just work and then you start to have to dig in. And I got to dig into a lot of, a lot of C. Uh, this is my first chance to actually dig into the kernel and if it hadn't already been, been fixed in 3.9, I would have gotten to send a sweet PR and get murdered on the mailing list. Great, so one big point is Large systems, especially multi-thousand node systems, very resistant to change. Uh, but that shouldn't be a reason not to change them. It should just be a reason to follow best practices. You should always plan ahead, regardless of the change. You should know what and where to monitor. One of the reasons the outage was actually, or not the outage, but the, the problem was as, took as long to resolve as it did, was because we were gathering the metrics, but we didn't know that we needed to watch those metrics. It was the idea of, they were being gathered, but no one was there to watch them, so they didn't really matter. Uh, so yeah, don't just know what you need to watch, know where you're gonna find it. And expect the unexpected. Rollback fallback plan, that's the reason why we were able to pull, it, pull back when we were. That was the reason why the second time we rolled it out, it was also significantly shorter. We got really good with our rollback fallback plan. Uh, and then limit your failure domain. Like I said, this is only about 50% of our nodes got introduced, significantly less than we, had to, we could have done and that was why the issue wasn't nearly as widespread as it might have been. And again, don't, don't try gossip in a multi-thousand node layer two network. Running kernel before 3.9 is not gonna work. Great, uh, and so with that, thanks. I'm MacB. If this was interesting, you might wanna work on something like this. You can go to that link, check it out, or talk to anyone here from DO, and we'll, we'd be happy to uh, give you some more information. Thank you. And I like blew through that, so sorry, sorry about that. Does anyone have any questions or anything? <coughs> All right. I'm curious what you actually ended up setting the, the cache GC to. Yeah, so we actually just went. Oh, goodness. Uh, so we ended up setting pretty large for our cluster. It's actually larger than our biggest region. Uh, so it can pretty much hold the entire region in, in the, our uh, cache. And it's important to note that just because the entry is cached doesn't mean it will be blindly respected. There is a mechanism where uh, cache entries get marked stale, and an ARP request is sent, but it's no longer a broadcast ARP request, it's a unicast ARP request, which means only those two nodes are really impacted, the router doesn't care about those at all, and so it's a significantly uh, smaller load for the entire network in general. And so they're still not, they're never marked, they're never just blindly trusted, uh, but it does mean no more broadcast ARPs. So yeah, I think ours is uh, like arbitrarily high, it's like 4K or something, 5K. Uh, which, is, which is good enough for, for our largest regions right now. Uh, but again, like, unless you deal with this problem, you, you should be okay. Cool, anything else? Uh, hey, what keeps you from uh, running a latest kernel? Ah, so one of the big things uh, kind of uh, on that slide about services is the statefulness of some of our services. So what keeps us from running that is we don't want to interrupt uh, customer droplets. And so we have to maintain our hypervisors at whatever kernel version they currently are. We, we do a lot to maintain that state of their droplet. We don't want to power off or restart droplets without absolutely having to. And so for a system like this that's, that's relatively low impact, it's a new system. It's not uh, like fixing a kernel bug that's uh, security vulnerabilities, for example. We're not gonna do anything that might impact customers' uh, lifecycle of their droplet. Yeah. Cool, anything else? All right, great, thanks guys. <laughs>